Hello, testing, one, two, three. There we go. Don't you just like it when stuff just randomly decides to not work? There we go. Right, good stuff. Excellent, we're ready to go. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, this week we're taking a look at an ANET printer. It's actually the first ANET printer I've actually taken a look at. I never bought an ANET A8 because, you know, they were not great. So today we're looking at the ANET ET4 Pro. I have looked at an ET4 printer before, and that was by Labists. I believe they probably purchased them from this company, ANET, and rebranded them. We don't know that for sure, but maybe. I don't know who's actually the OEM. Maybe Labists do more, and this is a little company. Don't know which way around, but either way. This is what we're going to be taking a look at today. And then when we get to the printing, we'll take a look at the Labist printer that I opened before and we'll do some comparisons. So as we go through this, I am gonna take a look at everything on the inside as well as on the outside, like we always do, just to make sure we can see what the electronics and the stepper drivers and all that kind of stuff is looking like. So of course, to begin with, we've got to get everything out of the box. Unlike nearly every other printer, they are using a slightly different foam. Normally it's this black foam. I'm not sure how different this is in reality, if it is just color difference or if it is like less dense or more dense. Feels roughly very similar. So we've got, oh, I should say, thank you to ANET for sending me this printer. I'm pretty sure it was ANET. Oh, really should have checked this before I started. I do apologize, silly me. Uh... <laughs> They were going to send an, uh, an ET5, which is like the larger version, but unfortunately they didn't have any in stock. So yes, it was ANET. So thank you very much to ANET for sending me this across. There's a link in the description below to purchase one from Banggood, which is an affiliate link, which means I get a small kickback when you do buy from there, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. And I'm not necessarily going to say you should or shouldn't buy it at the moment, this is just like unboxing first look kind of thing. So, but if you want to, there's a link in the description. It does help support me in what I'm trying to do here. So this looks like assembly manual and kind of contents. So lets you know what's in the box and that sort of stuff, a little user manual. We should have that up on screen as well. So when we do the assembly, you'll be able to see the instructions and follow along if you need to. That's that kind of stuff. Got some PLA, this is looking like a really strange kind of glossy PLA. Not just like a gloss, like a pearlescent sort of shimmery sort of PLA. A few basic tools, nothing particularly spectacular, but should be enough to assemble the printer, I guess. Uh, some zip ties and, well, there were like multiple use zip ties. They have like a little latch on and a belt for some, presumably looks like the X axis. Some screws for holding it together. Nice bright zinc bladed screws so they're not going to be rusty when they get to you, which is good. And then we got a nozzle, a spare nozzle by the looks of it, 0.4 nozzle, and then a micro SD card with that, with a micro SD card in it. Oh, hello to everyone who's joining and maybe to anyone new here who's not been on a live stream before. You're going to enjoy it, I promise. Wow. You should enjoy it. It's good fun. <laughs> it's fun for me anyway. Um, let's get this out of the box. So this looks like the hot end assembly. Very similar kind of structure to a Creality Ender 3 printer, if you're a little bit familiar with those. You've got kind of carriage with a hot end sort of attached to it. Looks like a probe, so got auto leveling probably of some variety. We'll take a look at the specs and stuff as we go through. Cooling fan. Portion hot, for obvious reasons. Hmm. Looks like bed surface, so it's a sticker. So that's like a, a replica of a kind of build tack style surface. Uh, this is a glass plate, I think that's all attached. So this is 
the assembly for the Z and X. Nicely supported packaging here for this lead screw. Hopefully should reduce any chances of it getting severely bent in the shipping process. And there's a nice little kind of daughter board at the back here for plugging things in. So I'm not sure yet if that's going to make it easier or more difficult for upgrading or, but it should make it easier for uh, replacing parts if they do get damaged because there's only a very short wire, should be fairly easy to do. Let's just put that down out of the way for now. Now we've got the bulk of the printer in the base. Got a power cable, another European power cable, which I can't use. Brilliant. That's the filament holder. And then that's pretty much it, I think. So let's get this bottom assembly out of the box. Yep, it's like just packaging. So that's that all out of the way. Right. Let's get some of this plastic off the top. That's interesting. That's all right, it's just because one foot was off the edge of the table. Uh, let's get this plastic off the top. Hmm. Looks like it's going to want something sharp to... Uh, Side cutters. Doesn't look like the printer comes with side cutters, unfortunately, so you may need to get some of your own. If you don't have any, of course. Some packaging foam in the sides. Support in the bed. Fairly decent sized wheels for levelling. Strange how it's got these and a sensor, so not quite sure what's going on with that. Oh, you have to pull these. There's like these rubber strips down the back and down the side, rather. And they normally can use them for like cable management Ooh. or something like that. In this case, they're just used to fill the channel to stop the wheels moving. So you pull that out to the side, it should come out, and then you can press the bed forwards, take the one, the small one, out of the back. Not very easy to get out, actually. But not tremendously bad either. I think this printer, the Labis one, came with some issues. We had to do some reassembly right at the start of the stream to get everything lined up. Is that that printer? It might not be. This looks very similar to what I remember though. Really bad connector here. This is just terrible. It doesn't really support it very much and this solder connection is directly on the other side. There's no real strain relief for that cable. It's all kind of kinked already. So is this going to be fire resistant a net printer? Probably not. So before we get too further, too much further forward, let's take a look inside. Look at all the components, see what kind of stepper drivers and control board we've got. And then we'll uh, switch to the assembly. Very typical looking disassembly process. For some reason I've got massive pieces of tape over this. Okay, sure. So just a few screws around the base. Let's switch views quickly. Yes, the tent from last week is obviously behind me. Warranty void if seal broken. Yeah, right, sure. Go away. Don't try and scare me. 
Not a chance. To be honest, whenever I see a warranty void stick, it makes me think, well, that's just because they're <laughs> the quality of the electronics and assembly inside is probably rubbish and they don't want you to see it. Looks like some pretty poor quality powder coating. Looks like there's some, been some, oh, maybe it's just a well finish under the, under the coat. So, while we're in here, I'm going to take some pictures as well so I can compare it to the other board. Right. So, power switch, well, that connector's not even attached properly. The switch is wobbly. The terminals don't fit properly. That one also wasn't fully inserted. That switch is also incredibly wobbly. Uh, good thing is they are cutting the live and the mains wires and they are using blue and brown and earth, uh, like yellow green. So actually, safety wise, apart from the fact that it didn't seem to be seated quite right, that's actually one of the better ones I've seen. The crimps look reasonably well made, they're fully covered, there's no chance of touching that or shorting between the terminals with the high voltage. Crimps are not overly smashed, so they look pretty good quality as well. That's actually, as a start from the kind of the power to the power supply, that kind of section looks good, especially in terms of colouring and that sort of thing. Uh, Power supply we've got is a Meanwell 350 watt, 24 volt unit. Again, one of these ones that's not rated for use in Europe, I believe, <laughs> because of the electrical noise. Same as the power supply we looked at last week on the CR6 SE. Check my video out about that if you want to see it. Um, All the connectors on the motherboard are a bit proprietary, which is kind of unfortunate. Obviously, we've got those daughter that well, at least one daughter board on the at the end of the X axis that we saw as we were unboxing. So that's probably going to be where you're going to want to interface with things if you need to change stuff. A little unfortunate. Connectors are not the same sorts of ones you find on other printers either. So not great, but again, what I do like they are locking connectors. So that is really actually quite good. All of the connectors have a little locking clip, so they've not had to use any glue. So that's actually really quite nice. Non-standard, but it is actually better than most. Even these looks like, yep. Even your display cables got a nice little lock on them. That's actually mint. Super happy with that. Stepper drivers, I can't actually see because again, they've got these glued on heat sinks, which I'm starting to get a little bit <laughs> fed up of because you can't see anything. But uh, the web page, the sales page does say TMC2208. So I'm expecting almost complete silence from this machine. It should be very, very low noise as a result of high steps per millimeter. Very small micro steps. Got a display here as well for the front. It looks like it's going to be a touch screen. There's no other interface. Uh, there's no separate 32-bit uh, controller on there as well. That's just directly into the main board. The processor is an STM32 F407 VG T6. Uh, got a fuse in here. Not sure. Presumably that's 250 volts. Guessing, or it could be for the bed, not too sure. Although it's a kind of irregular, non standard sort of board, and clearly a custom one, I am actually quite impressed, especially with the locking connectors. That's a pretty decent move. 
From those, in terms of general wire arrangements, all seems fairly reasonable. I'm not sure. I'm not a massive fan of long ribbon cables, but I've not had any breaks so far, so that's not the worst. The thing that's not good is this power management out the back. I'm not sure how well you can see it, but there's there's no real strain relief on it at all. That's going to probably be the first thing to die and be probably quite difficult to replace as well because it's all custom. So, yeah. Hopefully they have a replacement. I expect they do. In fact, I think I saw one on Banggood. If you look for ET4 Pro or ANET ET4 Pro, I think you can find replacements for the bed assembly and that comes with the cable all the way to here. So, yeah. Although I wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't need to buy one when you get the printer. Like it's not gonna break in like a few days or anything. It will take a while, but it will probably be the first thing to break and it may be quite unsafe in that eventuality. So just because you can replace it, doesn't mean it's kind of fine, we'll just accept it and replace them. It's not particularly good. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, actually reasonably impressed. So reasonably good start. It would be interesting to see what the kind of fan noise and stuff is once we get it booted up because it's all very well having nice silent stepper drivers but if you've uh, chosen really noisy whiny horrible fans you're still going to have a really loud printer quite large vents large vents here over the power supply, hopefully helping with some fairly okay slash decent airflow. Hopefully enough. Oops, lazy. Still using stainless steel screws because they're not magnetic is odd but true. So I wouldn't necessarily expect anyone to buy this printer and need to do what I've just done there. That's not part of the assembly process. You don't need to do that. That's just me taking a look inside so you can see and you don't have to do it yourself. But if you do want to do any maintenance, maybe swapping control board, changing things, upgrading stuff, that's how you get in the inside. Six screws. Not too bad at all. So, if we flip this over now, we'll get onto some assembly process. It is a bit strange that they've got a piece of glass here that's, oh, looks like it's designed, and then for some reason this extra mat as well that won't really fit particularly well, especially with these not particularly ergonomic screws, which are not screws, uh, clips which are going to be a pain in the ass to add and remove. Okie dokie. So if we switch over to this view, we've got this brief little instruction manual. And I think that's going to be the same. Not really, it's kind of similar. That's the user manual, setup manual. I mean, the one that I have here is for ET4, whereas this is obviously ET4 Pro. Uh, the instructions appear to be identical. Very nearly identical, if not completely. This looks like maybe a slightly newer version, but the instructions are basically the same. So, uh, we might need that later on. Well, probably not, but we should use it. So, much like many of these printers, if you've built one, you've built them all. They all assemble in very, very similar way. So it's four longer M4 normally screws that go up through the base into the kind of Z-axis sort of parts into the gantry frame. And then just a couple more screws for the spool holder. That's normally how it goes. So let's position this 
where it goes and work out how we're going to do this. I reckon we're going to tip it this way. Should have got the correct things prepared before starting to try and assemble the thing. That's not big enough. It's also not big enough. I think that's the right size. So I'm just screwing in kind of loosely for now, just to make sure I can get all the other screws in. Once we've got everything inserted, we'll uh, go around again and tighten it all up. Put it on one side, I'm just gonna flip it around and do the other. So the screws just go in the bottom here. This one appears to be jammed. Not great. This tool is not really cutting it. The, uh, I think the thread in the aluminium is just not very well done. So it's, it is actually, it like it could be half decent on things. So actually, maybe not. No, they're not. <laughs> Got a ball then though, which can be helpful for assembly. Unfortunately, they used a really flat extrusion here, so the screw's really deep, so you can't really get nice space to tighten it up. It does make the assembly process a bit uncomfortable and awkward when you don't consider how you're going to tighten things. Just like you would do design for manufacture to make sure that your manufacturing process is suitable. You also have to do DFA or design for assembly to make sure it can be assembled efficiently. Okay, so that's those four screws in and reasonably tight.
looks like next, or also in part of step one, kind of confusingly, is to place the carriage onto the rail here. So let's do that. All comes kind of coiled up, which is a bit unfortunate. And we've got a message, a warning message. Please check again if the port is stable after you complete the assembly of your printer. What? Check the port is stable. What are they talking about? <laughs> Seems reasonable. Standard PTFE tube that will go in there, and then some wires that will go around the back. So the belts. The zip ties out. Been a fairly smooth assembly process so far, actually. It's quite good. The belt just clips onto a little slot in the bottom of the carriage. Hopefully, if it's long enough. It's not long enough. Well, that's unfortunate, isn't it? How the dickens am I meant to do that? There's no tensioning. Ah, oh, there is on the motor here. So it doesn't actually mention this anywhere in the guide. But if you're having trouble assembling the belt, you can loosen these screws at the motor. That will allow this to go this way slightly and give you a little bit of extra length, which you can then pull back to tighten them, tighten the belt after you put it in. Pretty naff that they've not used washers here. Really should have done. There you go. That should be enough wiggle room to get me some extra length to assemble. Oh, it's still going to be close, I think. Oh no, that's venting out. Now I can pull the motor out. Oh, try not to put it off the desk though. Okay. Chat is working. Everyone's just quite quiet today, I think. Not quite as many people as normal, I think. Perhaps a few people saw Tom do this printer last week. So maybe there's a, a reduced interest, unfortunately. But that's how things go. Very easy. So you've got some removable zip ties, which is quite nice means you don't have to just chuck them away because you can just have a, like a little latch and you just press down and then it can be removed. So step three is to do, to plug some things in, specifically over here. So on this little daughter board around the back, which we looked at originally, or a while back actually. That leaf screw looks nice and straight, which is good. Audio seems a little low. Should we try? Am I just being quite quiet? Maybe I'm just being quiet. What I will try is... Uh, we'll try that level, see if that's any better. I'm not sure. Hopefully it's not going to peak. It might peak a little bit, in which case we'll give it a slight reduction. Hopefully that's going to be all right.
So it looks like all of these are wired, which is quite nice. You've got TMP, which will probably be the temperature. You've got BL. With bed leveling, presumably. You got fan something. You've got no, this is going to be the sensor. What is BL? End stop. BL must be a fan or bed light. Not too sure. But we just have to line them to what they say on here. So that should be fairly simple. That's temp. We've got fan. This one says fan. So we'll plug fan into fan. Oop. Fan into fan. We've got LV, which is presumably this one. It's the only three pin one, so that can go in there. Not a, uh, just the only one, I think. No, there's a couple. It's two that don't have locking connectors. Not sure why. And you've got BL and end. So BL will be this one here. And end, we end stop up over there. So there you go, that's all the connectors in there. Mm. I'm going to put a zip tie on here just to hold this a little more secure, although it may not do a whole lot. Mm, yeah, not sure that's helping a whole lot. <laughs> well, we'll keep it there for now. Um, Um, let's get a quick drink. My mouth's getting a bit dry. Spilt it. Oops. Um, so PTFE tube is mentioned. Oh, the zip ties are for this, attaching this to this, but it's already attached, so don't really need to do that. It says check the feet, uh, the wheels, the eccentric nuts. They all seem fine, so I'm not going to adjust those. We've got the Z motor down the bottom over here. So we've got the connector just taped to the, uh, to the base. Remove the tape. Stick that connector in that hole over there. Try not to drop it down the hole in the process. There we go. Get rid of that tape, don't need that. Uh, we've got this ribbon cable to sort out, so this has got to come up the side. So that looks like this will go through this own ear. Got a hole in the side. And then up to here. So we've got two clips, pull the clips out. And then as we push it in, they should close onto it. Not quite that. There we go. So nice closed over. That's not going to come out now. Do, 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 do. Looking pretty good, I think, so far. It's not been too troublesome. Bit of memory from the ET4 that I assembled before. It does look quite similar, so we'll find out how many similarities exactly in a bit. Last thing looks like just the spool holder. 
it's obviously provided that bed surface, but no instructions, so we shall leave it as it is, I think. So this is pretty easy to do. We've got this and this and this. Let's take that through there, tighten this on the other side. If you can line it up. I like to try and keep as much sticky out this side as possible. I mean, that's obviously going to fall off, so that's not great, is it? <laughs> Hopefully this will fit. <laughs> yeah, just about fits the spool I was planning to use today, so that will be okay. Then that sort of just sits off the side like this, and we can screw that down. So a couple of M5 screws into the plate, and then two nuts on the base. There you go, that's pretty secure. It's a bit not straight, but it'll work, I think, just fine. That's it for the instructions. So, yes, you've obviously got, well, these are rubbish, don't need those. And then you've got this print surface. It doesn't really say what you're supposed to do with it. What about this user guide? This is how to level. Okay, so I think it's time to move on to the ET4 Pro user manual, and that, is get, that should get us to a point where we're printing, I think, hopefully. Warranty, apparently. Thank you for purchasing a bit of materials for what's included. Don't really need any of that stuff. Get the tools out of the way. Not going to need those now, really. Uh, it is it's pretty much the right size, but I don't mm -hmm. think we had the same thing with the other ET4, to be honest. Some glass that was there, but didn't really stick to anything. I did used to actually print on glass quite a lot, but it was it's it's hard work to get right. It's not. It's not like trivial, it's not as easy as some of your more modern or more widely used services. I mean, BuildTac sticks to PLA like nobody's business, so. But then getting it off of something with glass, again, not great. If you have it like an aluminium, not aluminium, spring steel plate, being able to flex off is absolutely fantastic, easily my preferred way. Glass, it's, it's nice that it's really flat, typically it's really flat. And I think that's why it's quite often used. It's certainly why I used to use it in the past. The aluminium beds that are low cost tend to be a bit warped and wobbly. So if you want to print a decent area on there, you need something that's flatter because otherwise it, you, can't, you can't physically level a bed that's all over the place unless you start going like mesh bed leveling sort of thing, which is not really leveling. It's more just like a, a well, a bodge to <laughs> get around it. But yeah. Although it is very flat, obviously you can't flex it to get prints off, to get prints off. 
So you end up with like attacking it with a spatula or waiting ages and ages and ages for it to cool. So not perfect. Uh, we're about to find. We shall find out what sort of probe we've got here. And we shall also find out how loud it is. I think it's just about time to do that. Check the power supply, plug the... Uh, does it check? It's 220 volts. Check the power supply, plug the power cable into an outlet, turn on the printer, home the printing head. Okay. Need a power cable. Let's get this pointed over here. It does look really dark, that screen today. Right. They do actually have, I checked their website today and they've started creating Marlin firmware and open sourcing it. So it looks like Marlin firmware will be available for it in a very usable fashion soon, if not already. It's really difficult to see yellow, white text on a yellow background. So that's not a particularly great start in terms of user interface. Ah, is it a fixed one? Uh, well, it doesn't look particularly removable. I mean, I'm sure one could remove it if one was so inclined. But it's not like a easy removal. It also looks like it's a long way from the nozzle and probably just going to crash into the bed like the one did before. So we'll, we'll find out. We'll follow the instructions and see what it does. Plug the power cable, turn on the printer, home the printing head. Going to leveling. Uh, get all this junk out of the way. Don't need any of that. After assembling the machine, see, it's, it's in a weird order. The first thing in here says printing process for the first print. But really, you should probably start with leveling preparation. After assembling the machine, tighten the vertical rods on left by hand. Tighten the vertical rods on left by hand under the printer power off. Horizontally, observe the distance between the build plate and nozzle, making sure that there is a small gap between the tip of the nozzle and the top of the build plate for you to place a piece of A4 paper in between them. Make the sense head about two to three millimeters away from the platform, slightly higher than the thickness of, a rule, of the ruler. Okie dokie. So it actually says turn it off. We can turn this by hand. Now we need something that's two to three millimeters thick. Um, so, uh, hmm, what's going to be?
think these are quite a bit wider. These are like five millimeters. Four. Um, I think one of these tools will be about two and a half millimeters. 2.44. Here we go. Here's our leveling guide. So it doesn't say how to adjust this, it just says adjust it. Sure, I'll just adjust it by magic. making sure there's a small gap between the tip of the nozzle and the top of the burr plate for you to place an A4 paper in between them. Make the sense head about two to three millimeters away from the platform. So I do need to move this down to two to three millimeters. Rotate the four knobs at the bottom of the printing platform until the four vertices of the printing platform and the bottom base is horizontally consistent. The printer has been leveled before shipping. Users only have to do some adjustment. Leveled before shipping. Yeah, right. Wasn't even assembled. Uh, I mean, I don't know why they tell you to do this while everything is cold. Because it's not going to result in the greatest outcome. But that's what the instructions say. So that's what I'm going to do. I think this is the machine that Tom did last week. I don't know what crazy, what sort of crazy you're talking about. Crazy angry or cr crazy good? I mean, it would be uncharacteristic for an A-net printer to be, to be crazy good, I think. But never say never. Some peculiar instructions so far. Auto leveling. Now that we've leveled the printer, we're going to auto level it as well. Why? Power on the printer. Click setting manual home. Click setting. Oh, I can't see a blooming thing. Home is a house. Motion's reasonably quiet. So that's going to be a capacitive. No. Ah, uh, I always forget which one's which. Capacitive sensor will sense anything, right? So it's sensing glass, so it should be a capacitive sensor rather than inductive, which would only do the metal or aluminium. I don't think it's that. Click prepare leveling. Prepare. What?
repair leveling double click auto leveling start automatic leveling I quite like how the printer's set up to do these things, the movements kind of fairly quickly. I'm not sure where it's going now. Wow, did it really need to go up that far? Oh, we're into slow mode. Just as I was complimenting it for being quick, it's now going to go really slow. Oh wow, so slow. Yeah, it's physical physical position first, then electrical refinement. I'm following the guide. The guide shall not lead me wrong, and if it does, we shall enjoy the process. <laughs> so it says, the printer would have 5x5 five five points auto-leveling. The screen only displays 3x3 three three points. <laughs> wow. The auto leveling process finishes in six minutes. The auto the auto leveling process finishes in six. Okay, <laughs> I've got that sentence twice. So it finishes in six minutes twice. Uh, okay. Click on the OK key on the pop up interface to end the leveling. Okay. Uh, don't forget to hit like. By the way. The, you know, the, the thumbs up thing below. If you enjoy it, uh, lets me know. And also don't forget to subscribe for more things and supporting the channel and stuff like that. This is quite slow. Oh, we're good. Complete leveling. Okay. 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 Click on the OK key on the pop-up interface to enter the leveling. Click the OK key on the leveling interface to check the disk between the nozzle and the platform. Which should be exactly the thickness of a piece of A4 paper. If you set minus value, the nozzle will begin printing close to the build plate. If you set plus, the nozzle will begin printing farer to the build plate. <laughs> Farther from. Click OK to save the value. Okay, so we want to our piece of paper back, which incidentally is going to be quite a little bit thinner than 0.2 millimeters, I believe, but we shall have a quick loop. 0.1 millimeters. Cheap paper. <laughs> so this we want a minus, 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 a 
Cool, minus one millimeters. Click OK to save the value. It's kind of weird, like, it's fine to do it once you have the instructions. But if you were to try and work it out, like, you'd never get it. Manual leveling. Okay, we don't need to do manual leveling because we've done auto leveling. Load the filament. Get a roll of ANET 1.75mm filament. Recommend PLA filament. Okay, I'm not going to use ANET filament. I'm going to use Prusament filament this week. Neatly trim the end and push through the filament detector to the extruder. Load the filament. Right, okay, let's do this as it says. Stick that bad boy on there. I know we've still got instructions on screen, but I'm not following those. Uh, the side cutters are wide enough. So through the filament sensor into the extruder. Click prepare, load filament. Um, prepare. Reasonably prepare. Filament load. The printer will begin to load the filament once the extruder reaches the set temperature. If the printer works properly, you'll find an evenly extruded filament coming out of the nozzle. Okay, well we won't because it's right close to the bed, so that's a bit unfortunate, isn't it? Can we move it? Mine just says CH filler. <laughs> oh, change filament, isn't it? That's what it's supposed to be. Neatly trim the end, put it through the extruder, load the filament, press the load button. If the printer works properly, you'll find an evenly extruded filament coming out the nozzle. If no filament comes out, please click load button again. Well, I'm guessing it's what it really wants is me to push this all the way because otherwise it's never going to make it to the hot end. Okay, it's starting loading now. And instructions to unload as well, which we obviously don't need right now. So now we need a print file on the TF card, Trans Flash card, or also known as a micro SD card. And we're going to do a benchy today. Oh, yeah, Streamlabs is having fun again. Apologies. You can't, you can't use decimal points without spaces. It thinks you're sparing links. Oh, symbols this time, actually. Because you used a dash and a dot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit keen, isn't it? So I've got a view 
set up. So the slicer that they suggest, or it comes included with, is Kira 14.7. And this particular version was released in 2014. So they're really up to date. I mean, it's only been released six years ago and they're still recommending it on printers being sold today. Wow. I prepared this earlier, so it did come with a configuration file on this USB drive on the micro SD card. And once you've installed Cura, it tells you to load the configuration and then change all of the settings. What's the point in a configuration if you then have to change all the settings? I just found that hilarious. Wow, that's a lot of filament. Did it really need to load this much filament? Maybe it was wanting to do it all the way from the back after all. Anyway, that's that. So, oh, now Adam's spamming symbols. <laughs> Trouble is, I can't un I can't unhide the message. Once it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> Uh, so as it recommends this slicer and this is what's included this is what we're going to be using uh, here we go Kira 14.7 <laughs> from 2014 so I'm expecting the quality to not come out particularly great purely because things have moved a long way since then Peter, you knew that was going to trigger the bot. <laughs> uh, so if we load in a benchy, it looks like it's going to start slicing that straight away. Wow, Kira is uh, difficult to use all the way back then, wasn't it? So this is one hour 46, because the print settings are incredibly slow. Uh, what we're going to do is scale it down until we find a point where we can do it in like 45 minutes ish. Hopefully, you like that. <laughs> the bot is extremely predictable. There we go, 45 minutes to do 6 grams of filament. The speed is just ridiculously slow. <laughs> the nights <laughs> go me. Uh, so, yes, let's slice this. Save toolpath. Calls it a toolpath. Share on you imagine. Uh, no thanks. Uh, save toolpath, text that doesn't even actually quite fit onto the screen. But we'll do it. Save it to this SD card. Format the card first. Is it going to be... Is it not going to work? What do I need to format it to, James? What format are we looking for? It seems to have worked okay to this point. Let's oh wow! So it's the touch screen. <laughs> you can't select. You can't select it by touching it. What? How bad is that? Can you imagine that on your phone? You're like trying to use it and it's got like a scroll wheel up the side of something. Wow, okay, so three benchy. Oh, 
Okay, if this doesn't work, I'll try formatting it. But as it didn't say to do that, I'm going to try it without doing that first. If it doesn't work, that's solution number one, because that's quite easy to do. Thank you for suggesting it, because that means other people that do have the same problem can hopefully see it in the chat as well. You are where Tom was, including the SD card. So it looks like it's heating up the bed very, very slowly. And we just twiddle our thumbs and wait for it to do the things. And it's off. I'm going to try and take this blobby off of here first. Ooh. Ugh. I think the lead screw maybe needs some extra lubricant. Yeah, I, the lead screw is a bit dry, I think. Well, it's printing, but it's not printing because nothing's sticking to the bed. Well, that's a colossal failure, isn't it? That what I expected. Terrible. Right. Let's see if we can uh, maybe try cleaning the bed a little bit, if that will help. <sighs> the problem with glass beds, unless they're in absolutely perfect condition, nothing will stick. Normally I would do this when cold, it's a little bit safer and you get a little bit better clean as well. But as we need to kind of just get on with it, I'm just getting on with it. Let's just try it again straight away. PLA seems to really like sticking to that nozzle as well. Oh, what I will do, let's add a bit of lubricant as well. I'm just going to go for some basic stuff. I've moved my lubricants to a different place and now they're in a strange place. Yeah, this will do. Yeah. Just some basic three in one. Some silicone based stuff would probably be better, but. I think this, because uh, we're using a very old version of Kira, it doesn't have a lot of the kind of improvements in settings that have been developed over the last six years that help with like first layers. So for example, doing the first layer slower to give it time to stick. It doesn't seem to have any interest in that. It's just going for it. Uh, I think it might have just about worked. I don't know if it's going to make it to the end, though. Right. 
Looks like we might have just about made it past the first layer. There's a piece of filament sticking up which is probably going to uh, cause issues, but... I think now we sort of just let it go. Not like physically, just don't touch it and let it print. I'm going to move this away from me a little bit. Over the last couple of weeks when I've been printing and sitting right on top of the printer as it prints, I've ended up with what is probably a bit of a sinus infection from the, presumably from the fumes. So I'm going to try and stay a little bit away from the printer today, if I can, just to try and prevent that. Obviously I am pretty close, so I would not recommend necessarily doing this. Keep your printers printing in another room or in a enclosure that's properly ventilated or filtered. Robert, we're both printing our benches at the same time then. Early, I got mine actually earlier in this week. It's been here just a few days. In terms of noise, it is reasonably quiet. The actual motion and kinematics is pretty... Oh, no. Okay, well, the cooling fan has just come on, and that's quite loud. Before that, the power supply fan was quite audible. It's not super, super loud. Again, it's that kind of consistent hum, so it's audible, but not going to wake you up in the night or anything like that, or stop you going to sleep. It is a little bit different to an Ender 3. Ender 3 doesn't have a filament sensor or a uh, any form of auto bed leveling. It also doesn't have a touch screen. Obviously the overall kinematics do look very similar to an Ender 3, so I absolutely understand where you're coming from. But there are some differences which make it a potentially worthwhile purchase. Also standard Ender 3 doesn't come... Oh, there we go. The standard Ender 3, as I was saying. So, yeah, it just didn't stick properly. Surprise, surprise. Uh, we're going to modify this benchy in here a little bit by hopefully trying to take off the bottom part. Can you do that? You can't even do that, can you? Tools. No, this is a problem with stupid old versions of software. For anyone that gets this machine, don't use this version of Cura. Use the latest version. You'd be daft to use this ridiculously old version. Uh, what I'm going to try and do I'm going to use Prusa Slicer just to cut the bottom off and hopefully save it as something that we can pull into this. Prusa Slicer doesn't like being in a fraction of the window. So if we... Uh, do, 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 do. Window capture. Oh. So there's probably better ways to do this, but I'm going to do it the sort of lazy way. So, once I've got this in here, I can use the cut to just take this text off the bottom 
and we'll keep the upper part on the cut. And now I believe we can save this as an STL. Uh, export STL. Now, if we go back to Kira, my hope is that we can then get rid of this model here and open the one that I just saved. Oh golly. <laughs> yeah, this is 14.7. It was released in 2014. That's not the version you want to be using. I'd highly recommend getting a new version of Kira. These versions are super, super old and outdated. So now our Benchy has a smooth base, so this should be a lot easier to print. So if we scale this down, I think 70% was about the right point. I'm not surprised this could drive anyone crazy. It's absolutely terrible. The thing that annoys me most is that it's open source software. Anyone can have the latest version whenever they want it. Like, to literally be instructing people and providing to them files for software that's six years out of date. It's absolutely crazy. Right. Yeah, so Kira got to like version 15 or like high version 14s and then it basically reset. So the, like the new Kira is on version 4 and that's like the newest, but the old Kira stopped at like 14 or 15.2 or something like that. So there you go. Slightly confusing, but that's what it is. Uh, it's difficult to see this from an angle. 3D Benchy cut base. Okie dokie, hopefully that'll heat up and work just fine. The thing about the, uh, some of you might be wondering why I've not just put this on. This is like a, a clone surface, looks very similar to what a build tack would be. Firstly, I don't think that's actual 3M. Uh, secondly, there's nowhere in the instructions that tells you to do it. So a general user might just be like, oh, they sent it to you by accident, or maybe this is better, or what's this for? Don't know, I just put it in the bin. I don't need it because it doesn't say when to use it so I'm not going to use it because I'm not going to provide well, based on something that they don't tell you to do uh, and also once you do get this on these clips that are difficult to like maneuver even on this glass are going to be even worse once you stick an extra like half a mil of blooming plastic sheet on it Okay.
It might work a little bit better this time. So yeah, I mean, if you are a general user and you want to put this on, well, general user, if you're a, if you're a person, you would probably want to, you might want to consider using this, but do be aware, you might want to cut like little parts out around it on the glass to, to make sure it secures a little bit better. Or maybe remove the glass and just put this straight on the aluminium. Not perfect because it's not removable, but it might be better. If you're having real trouble sticking to glass, then that might be an option. Or you can just put this on the glass and have to deal with some slightly annoying clips. Or maybe you could get some like bulldog clips, which are like a really cheap clip for papers. They have this like the black part and the little silver levers. And they can be quite, I mean, they're not great, but they do work. So that could be a very cheap option to help you, uh, help you out if you're having trouble getting things to stick to the glass. A lot of people will recommend, especially on Facebook groups, to use like painter's tape and glue stick and stuff. I would not bother. Like painter's tape, definitely not. It's the biggest pain in the ass. You have to keep reapplying it. It's not that trivial or quick to apply in the first place. So just don't bother. Although it does work reasonably well. Uh, glue stick, you can sort of do. But again, you have to keep cleaning it. It's really quite, it's not as messy as something like hairspray, but I'd much rather just try and keep it clean than apply glue, remove the glue, apply the glue, remove the glue, wash it off. <laughs> glue stick in my, in my experience, glue stick's best as, uh, what do you call it? To stop things sticking too much, you have like the interface layer. Oh, I've forgotten the name for it. It's basically like you put the glue stick on so that when you print down, you've got like a destructible layer between them that will disintegrate as you remove it rather than to help it stick. A releasing agent, that's the word, release. I mean, yeah, if you want to spend other money on going for different bed solutions, then uh, my favorite style of bed solution is magnetic sheet with... Um, spring steel and a textured, I mean, the, the, the print surface will depend quite a lot on the materials you choose to print. If you're printing PLA pretty much all the time, something like Build Tack is really good. Uh, surface is really, really good for PLA. It does stick very, very well, but not so well on other materials. So PETG and other stuff, I would not necessarily make it and recommend as much. Textured bed surfaces, I find really good for PEI. If I use textured beds pretty much a large amount of the time. They do work really well. Yeah, you can use hairspray, but it's also super messy and super annoying and gets everywhere and it's more expense than you need. Like, just clean the bed. So this print's probably going to come off as well because it's starting to warp at the sides. I don't know what temperature the bed is. Maybe the bed just needs to be bumped up a little bit. It's probably not quite as hot as it should be. But again, that's what I recommended. I mean, this is not supposed to be like a print diagnosis stream. It's supposed to be a test of the instructions that are provided. So yeah, I could make this print print. This printer do what I want to do if I want to but this is not really the point it's not trying to test me and what I can make a printer do the point of the stream is to test the instructions and to see how the printer performs under the instructions of the manufacturer with their recommended settings their recommended stuff with this surface and this slicer with these settings this is what you get and this is obviously assuming that everyone manages to follow the instructions a lot of people can find some complex instructions difficult to follow. So they may not even get this far. 
Are you saying you can print on glass without an adhesion promoter? Yes, absolutely. I did for absolutely ages. You just have to keep it clean. When it's clean, it does stick. A lot of, I did, probably printed for maybe a good part of six months or something. Just printing everything straight onto glass. PLA or a PLA Pro sort of material. Uh, just straight on glass. Didn't really have, I mean, that was quite a while ago. Around 20, oh, there we go. It's come unstuck. So, I mean, this is just getting silly, isn't it? It does depend, I think, a little bit on the type of glass as well. I think this is probably, I don't know what temperature that is, but it doesn't feel super hot. It could probably do with being a little bit hotter. Uh. No, the first layer distance is good. If you try for a better squish, you end up with, well, really the opposite, and it ends up curling up outside of the nozzle, and then it collides, and then it just takes it straight off the bed. A bit of a myth that making it closer forces it onto the bed. It doesn't really do that. I mean, I can't even see where to add a brim in this old archaic software. Retraction, skirt, line around, start distance, minimal length, cool, brim, brim amount, four. Should be a brim and there isn't a brim. How do you enable brim? This is terrible. I'm not going to use a raft. You don't need to use a raft to print a bench. <laughs> What's the easiest option here? I want easy. Really. <laughs> Do I have a proper version of Cure on here? So we just look, I might just download the latest version of Cura. Glue stick's probably the easiest option here, actually, isn't it, to be fair? As much as I dislike the use of glue stick. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. There you go. That's a pretty generous application of glue stick. Let's just try again. It's already cooled all the way down.
In the meantime, I'm going to get the latest version of Kira and I'll start creating a profile on there, perhaps. <laughs> PG, you do love your emotes. <laughs> Something's starting to smell a little bit funky, I'm not going to lie. Like even the priming methods have improved vastly since, I mean this is just making a mess, it really is. terrible Kira and launch hello Robert no Rota I can't pronounce the rest it looks German and that's going to be difficult <laughs> or probably insulting most likely uh, now where's Kira gone The first layer stuck down. Hopefully, it'll stay stuck down. Um, ba, 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 ba. There you go. This is what real Cura looks like. So, if we uh, add a printer, I guess. I don't use <laughs> Cura very much at all, hence, me not having the latest version. But it looks like they've got loads and loads of profiles. So, Anet BT4 Pro. Well, okay, that. Loads of materials as well. I'll just stick it on PLA. 1, 2, 20%. And we'll add so again, that's really, really slow. We're going to have to take it down. Oops case we do need it. 60%. So there we go, we've got that kind of ready now. We may not need it, but we may. We'll see how we do. RFZ, RFZ, RFZ. <laughs> I 
Peter Simple, I think everything you say is just getting uh, <laughs> stream labsed. I think part of the issue here, the uh, the front of the boat is curling up. And then it's kind of cooling in that position. And then as the nozzle comes over the top, that's then kind of a lever and it's just popping the back off. Oh, golly. Are we all just trying to make... Can we just leave Streamlabs alone? He's obviously having a very difficult day. <laughs> I almost started drinking this. Let's put that away. This was another four bolts build indeed. Two left, two right, and well, it was six, because there's two for the, uh, you know, the thing at the top, a small holder. Words just escaped me for a moment. So if you want to get this version of Kira, you can just literally Google Kira and browse to the downloads page i think it's version 4.8 or something that it just downloaded so and it comes with all sorts of profiles so that should be enough to get you going rather than messing around with the old 14.7 version which yeah i like how well no i just dis dislike how in the instructions it even says like if you can't use the one on the sd card download a new one from the website scroll past the old versions and download 14.7. What? Why would you do that? It's absolutely craziness. Yeah, the front of that boat is sticking up a mile. The, the cooling fan just basically is doing nothing. It seems to be at 29%. Oof. Terrible settings. No, if it, it needs to be cooled quicker because it's it's being allowed to cool slowly and it's in that time it's curling up. If you cool it very quick, it tends to just kind of stick in place. Uh, I don't really have any opinions on the 3D print mill until I own one. Uh, I don't think I'm in line to get one as far as I know. So, and I'm not going to be backing a Kickstarter that's like very expensive. So... Unless I get sent one, I, which I would really like, to be clear, <laughs> I would really like to try one. I'm not going to be buying one, I don't think. So, yeah, not really much to say about it at the moment. But do look forward to hopefully getting one. It seems like half my stream now is just, it's like half the people are watching the stream and asking questions about 3D printing. And the other half are just like playing with Streamlabs bot, <laughs> trying to see if they can get kicked. <laughs> no thoughts in terms of durability. Well, I don't have one, so how can I know if it's durable? It's literally, it's really impossible to give any meaningful comments about a printer without trying it. Even if it's as short as doing a live stream like this. Like, I don't really know that much about it. I know generally what its impressions are and I know generally what the intent is. But I don't know the details. 
Yes, I've heard about the iFactory one too. Another kind of 45 degree or angled infinite Z dot printer. Again, happy to take a look at one. It's quite easy to get hold of me if any of these companies would like to send me a printer to do this look at for you. It's super valuable, I think. <laughs> the tent last stream is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> no, no other thing quite so weird. It's quite a good tent though, I have to say. I've been using it all this week and it is it's peak tent, it really is. <laughs> Tent, tents, 3D printing tents don't get much bigger than that, that's for sure. I mean, actually, it works as a heating enclosure. It's... Hopefully we're far enough to print now, it's actually not going to kick itself and die. What I'm going to try now, oh, that's about as far as that's going to go. I do want to have a look at the old Labist ET4, which I have also. Uh, and we can just do a quick comparison to see how different things are, or more likely, how similar things are. So, <laughs> this is the hot end for the Labists ET4. I'd say look pretty blooming similar. In fact, I'd go as far as to say identical. Literally exactly the same. Even the tape is in the same place. There is no difference. The stickers and everything are the same. Hot end is the same. Sensor is the same. So that's one part. The included filament looks also to be exactly the same. Same label, same font, same text, same bag. Identical colour, identical shimmer. Uh, Included accessories, screws, the same. Nozzle, the same. Micro SD card reader, the same. Belt, the same. Manual, quite a lot more significant manual with the Labists one. The gantry, obviously the printer's not assembled. That should be obvious at this moment. There's a lot more grease on this one. This uh, uh, so we go to a different so this one's got a lot more grease up the screw. This looks the same, this arrangement's all the same. This is the same, extruder's the same. This is coupling's the same, the plate. Material dimensions are all the same. Yep. The labeling of the model numbers and everything on the stepper motors is the same. And then we have the base. I mean, this looks uh, the same. 
everything at the back is the same, even the connector is bent in the same weird way. Belt assembly is the same, the bed surface is the same, glass, the cable is the same, this is the same. So let's take a closer look inside of this one and see if that's all the same. Judging by what we've seen so far, I would be surprised if it isn't. You left the blue plastic on the heated bed. It didn't tell me to take it off, did it? The, uh, that plastic is not on the top of the glass, it's on the top of the metal, the aluminium plate. But it doesn't say to remove it, so would most people remove it? I don't think so. Oh, would you look at that? Cheapo power supply. In the Labist's one. Not a brand named meanwhile. This is a, a Cheng Lang. 240 watts. So it's 90 watts less and no named brand. Control board looks the same. Arm processor looks the same. Screen, cables, layout, all the same. The power supply, that's quite an important component and that is different. The Labis one has a cheap power supply that's only 240 watts, which is not great. So yeah, of the two, if you can find them both for the same price, I would get the Anex because well, it has a proper power supply, and this one just has a knockoff one. This, the Labis was really loud as well, actually, wasn't it? They must have had some A4988 drivers on here. Let's. Uh, I took a picture of the board. Let me just see if the versions of the uh, board numbers are the same. See, the, this board is labelled ET4PMB, version 1.0. This one is labelled ET4... Oh, so this is labelled ET4 Pro, this is just ET4. So this is effectively an ANET ET4, I believe, and not the Pro. So it is a 32-bit ARM processor, but with the A4988 drivers, which is why this machine was significantly louder. If you go have a look at my stream that I did for this one, you'll probably find out, or you'll be able to hear the difference in the noise level. Connections and stuff are all literally the same. These two machines are basically identical in every single way, apart from the aforementioned power supply and stepper drivers. To be honest, I've not checked the prices. I don't know. I would not. I would expect this one to be cheaper, as it's uh, based on the Anet ET4 and not the ET4 Pro. That one definitely have a noise, a noise and power supply quality advantage, though, significantly. Although this power supply is uh, silent, so that's a thing. I seem to remember it being particularly loud though. Hence I disassembled it immediately after stream and was like, I'm never going to use that.
So there you go, a comparison between the two. Very much physically the same design. This one obviously has some green parts. If you like green, that might be great for you. Obviously I've stuck the bed on this one. I think it did that in the stream just to get something to actually stick. Otherwise, very much, very, very, very much similar printers. Power supply difference and stepper driver difference. Stepper drivers is quite a big deal. This is a fair bit quieter. Oh, but the print quality is absolute garbage. <laughs> it's all over the place. The cooling, I think, has just really badly affected it. Or I should say, the lack of cooling. The connections, we, I mean, we looked at the ANET at the beginning of the stream in terms of uh, build quality, electrical stuff. All actually quite good, I thought. There's locking connectors on all of the connectors on the motherboard, which is nice. So unlike Creality, who uses glue, they've just gone for the proper solution, which is locking connectors. Both the mains and neutral wires were cut on the main switch. So it means when you cut it off, there's nothing going to the power supply at all. It just stops. Uh, what were the other good things? The crimps on the terminals were not like overly smashed, so the wires wouldn't be damaged. They just like nicely gripped, so that's nice. And of course the power supply was a Meanwell power supply with 320 watts as opposed to the Labis, which was a 240 watt model. What's my go-to printer, the Prusa Mini? It sits in that little box over there and whenever I need anything, it just goes. Like, no questions, nothing. If it fits, it just prints and that's it. There's no... No ifs, no buts, it just does it. And that's how I like it. <laughs> uh, it was the Prusa Mark III for a while, but it's getting a bit old. It makes the, the interface is just a little bit of a pain to use. I mean, it is a little pain. Obviously, I've got quite a lot of options in terms of printers, so I go for whatever is the easiest for me. The Prusa Mini sits really nicely in that little LAC enclosure which means it doesn't really get any dust on the bill plate. So if it sits for a long time, I don't have to really like spend a lot of time cleaning it up. It's already as clean as it was when I last left it and it will just print again. I never like sit and watch the first layer or anything like that. It's just go, leave the room, come back later and it's done. Like it's literally that simple. So that's been really good for me. Uh, you did see a sensor, so both this and the, so the ANET printers, let me start that again. Both the ET4 and ET4 Pro, so the ET4 being the Labis one and the Pro being this one, have sensors. They're not uh, inductive sensors, which is what you would normally find. They are capacitive sensors. The difference being capacitive sensors can sense any material, as far as I'm aware. So for this one where you've got a glass bed, the capacitive sensor will sense the presence of the bed and it can trigger. The downside of the capacitive sensor is it's very sensitive to temperature fluctuations. So on a day where you're printing at 20 degrees or on a day where you're printing at 30 degrees or when the bed's a little bit warmer than it would otherwise be or the hot end's been printing or just after you're printing you're starting another one and it levels every time or stuff like that, that can make a significant difference to a capacitive sensor. An inductive sensor has less effect from temperature although it still does, there is still an effect there but it doesn't, an inductive sensor can't detect glass. My personal preference, well, this is where it gets a bit difficult. I don't think any sensors on the market at the moment do a particularly great job of bed sensing. I've had issues with all of the above. Uh, I do prefer some automated system over manual leveling in general but there are still issues with everything. I think, yeah, that's, that's the answer to that question.
an Ender 3 clone on eBay for £98. Wow. That sounds explodey and fiery and dangerous. The Pro does not, there's no strain relief on this bed at all. I would expect it to be one of the first things to break and fail potentially dangerously. Yeah, not, not super fantastic. The wire is like kinked out of the, uh, well, out of the factory as it is right now. So that's also not a great start. My nose starting to tingle from the uh, PLA fumes. It's strange, I can't smell a thing, but every week, like when I do these live streams and I sit by a printer for an hour while it prints, afterwards I've got runny nose and a headache and all this kind of stuff, and it's pretty annoying. It lasts for like a couple of days and then it goes away. Probably not very healthy. I think I'm going to try and get an enclosure so I can do these prints, stick it in the enclosure and then print with over the other side of the room with filtration and stuff. I think that might be the way to go, but also quite expensive and taking up quite a lot of room and I don't have much room. Space is a bit of a challenge at the moment. The printer does kind of fluctuate its noise levels. At the moment it's quite quiet, but I think when, I think it's either the power supply or hot end cooling fan or something, well the park cooling fan speed up, that tends to increase the noise by quite a bit. <laughs> Why did you buy it if you think it's going to be crap? <laughs> oh, I don't understand people sometimes. It sounds like a band that's trying to copy Creality. How are we doing? Apparently halfway. This is not impressive at all. I can see the newer Cura profile probably increasing the fan speed and probably producing a better result, but not great. Speaking of AliExpress, I swear they used to have an affiliate program because I thought I'd signed up to it and I was getting, I had links and stuff for it, but I can't find their affiliate stuff anywhere anymore, so.
just kind of waiting now. <laughs> Anyone has any questions or things? Now's a great time while we watch this finish the most atrocious benchy I've ever seen. <laughs> it has some good bits, but has a lot of not so good bits. Have I done any mods to my mini? Mm, no! I have the filament sensor, which is like an add-on, so not really a modification as such, it's just one of the up... Like, does it count as an upgrade? It's kind of a standard upgrade. Uh, other than that, no, it's all just the normal stuff. Version 1, just plain straight out of the box. I've had such good. It seems like the, the uh, community in general has a lot of really mixed feelings on the mini. Some people have been like my experience, where it's just been really, really good, and you've had some people that have had like hot end jams and clogging and all sorts of problems. It is a drums channel now, yeah. Played the drums when I was younger. Not very good at it, but I did. <laughs> and now, every now and then, I just tap things for a while. Have you done any mods? Oh, I've already done that. This printer is so silent. It's boring. It's boringly silent. I think that's probably a good thing. Finished printing an X-axis cable restraint and a new LCD screen that has a USB cable extension. That USB cable extension would be really useful for me, actually. Having to reach all the way to the back, especially when it's in an enclosure and you're like sticking your arm through and you can't quite find it, is a bit of a pain. So yeah, having that USB drive, it should be, in my opinion, like at the LCD. That would be the perfect place for it. Just off to the side, next to the screen, plonk it in, doodle doo, -doo, -doo done. I'm not sure people, I'm not sure why there's a Bontech upgrade for the Mini. I don't really feel like it's needed it. Uh, yeah, most of the quality problems are because the fan... So can we... I mean, the fan is just absolutely shockingly bad. And it keeps changing it as well. So even if I set it to 100%, it's just going to change it again and it'll go back down. And of course, it took ages to stick to the glass. We ended up adding glue stick, which shouldn't be needed. I mean, in 2020, I really feel, I mean, as terrible as this year has been, I really feel like we're the, past the point of using glue stick. Apart from, in exceptions, of extreme materials as a release agent, not as a bonding agent. Shouldn't need to use glue to print PLA on a new printer in 2020. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I just read, almost lost the SD card when I ejected it from the printer. Boing. The spring in the card is so strong. Yeah, a lot of these, some of the card slots I actually prefer without the spring in them. I do find the ones with the spring, is, if they stick out just far enough, I tend to just pull it out and push it in and not bother with the spring. But with, yeah, the spring, if you, if you do it like at the edge and just slip off, it can just shoot out. But not the end of the world.
polycarbonate um, it's one of the recommendations when printing a PC blend which is a polycarbonate based material with presumably some additives to make it a little bit easier to print from Prushment and they recommend using uh, glue stick as a release agent when printing that material because otherwise it sticks too much to the print bed. Yep, TPU as well. TPU is one of those strange materials that it you don't really get much assistance from having a flexible bed because obviously TPU is inherently flexible. So depending on the geometry and density you've printed it out, you can end up with quite a rigid part if it's very dense and you've done lots of thick walls and high infill, that sort of stuff. But in like generally speaking, if you're printing like I don't know what's a general shape I don't know but because it is flexible if you try to flex it off the bed it can just grip to the bed and you don't get anywhere so yeah having a release agent and times like that can be easy the advantage obviously of P TPU is it's very very durable and because it's flexible on a rigid bed you can just kind of tear it off like there's very little risk of actually damaging the part because it is so flexible so Yeah, I've heard people have ripped chunks out of glass with PTG. Never happened to me, but I'm not saying it's not possible. It's clearly happened to quite a few people. I've seen images that suggest that's what happened, but not a problem that I've faced thus far. How are we doing percentage wise? Can't really see because it's yellow and white and those colours can't be visible from this angle. The viewing angles on the screen are not very good. If I just stand over it like this I can probably read it. But it's more orange from this angle isn't it? 83%. From this angle it's 100% yellow. Yeah. 83% so not too much to go now. 68 viewers, 40 likes. Don't forget to like. Of course, thank you very much, I should say, to Anet for kindly sending over this printer for me to do this video. And I've left a, a link in the description down below, which is an affiliate link. So if you buy from that, it sends a little money my way, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. So if you are looking to buy one of these machines, I would be, well, grateful, grateful. I would greatly appreciate it if you use that link as I do get a small kickback so that's very helpful for me Slowly getting towards the top of the print now. But I have a feeling it's going to start to go exceptionally slow when it gets towards the top. Or it might go really, really fast and just be a huge smudgy blob. I think a lot of the problems we're seeing in terms of the print quality, well, I can see, probably you can't quite see so much so far, are really just down to the slicing profile. These archaic softwares... I mean, old versions of Cura were not that great, in my opinion, which is why I stopped using them. But the newer versions are much better. They have a lot more options for customizing things and a lot of improvements that help improve quality on your printer. So I reckon if you used uh, the most recent slicer, which you can see on screen now. So Cura 4.8. I know it sounds weird that 4.8 is newer than 14.7 but they went like up to version 14 or late 14s or early 15s or something and then they kind of did a reset and they're like 
New Kira started back at version one or thing I think or something or started at three or something strange like that. But yeah, we're back on low numbers for Kira versions. So 4.8 is the most recent, I believe. Uh, I've not seen Tom's video on the Sidewinder X1. Sounds like I might need to take a look at that. Yeah, I got like a craft knife, palette knife kind of thing with the printer recently. Was this with the CR6 SE last week? I think it might have been. I can't imagine. Oh, I mean, the handle looks really damaged, which is odd. It's probably just because it's been in a bin of like 100,000 of these and it's just got a bit mashed up. But, I mean, it's so thick at the end, I'm not sure how that's going to help you remove a print because you can't get close enough. You can't like dig under the thing, so... Not really going to, I mean, it's more for like spreading or something, isn't it? Don't really know. I think the, my critics, I can't really remember, the Sidewinder X1 I looked at quite a long while ago. The more recent was the Genius. The, I think the worst part that I noticed for that was that ribbon cables were not great. I think they're not rated for particularly high current. And I think there's quite a lot of current going through them for the hot end stuff. But I don't remember the other parts being so bad. I'll, I'll take a look at Tom's review and see if I... Agree or disagree? Of course, people do get a range of different things. Some people's looks good and some people's looks bad. I think in, in, in some ways, ribbon cables of some specifications must be fine because I'm pretty sure that's what's used in 2D printers, which do a lot of moving. Uh, and they've been around for years and years and years and are in many production environments, offices and everywhere. And they use a lot of ribbon cables for the moving components. But they also don't do quite as much heating, I don't think. Although they do, st mm, some do, don't they? Yeah, gonna have to check it out, I think. A mix of connector types on the board that were hot glued in. Yeah, I mean, that's... That is something I do commonly check. Having a mix of different connector types can be annoying, but not necessarily bad. Creality hot glues nearly everything in, which is, again, annoying, but I'd rather them hot glue stuff in than have stuff come out. If, like, if they're going to bluntly refuse to use the proper solution, which actually has been done here, which is a locking connector, and they're going to hot... Um, and they're going to have problems because they refuse to do that because stuff comes out, or partly comes out, which is even worse, which could then result in heating or other sorts of bad things, then I'd rather they use hot glue as a solution that actually works than have nothing and it is dangerous. Hot glue is a terrible solution, to be clear, but it is sort of a solution. But having mismatching connectors is not necessarily unsafe if they're properly rated. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It can just be a little bit annoying to upgrade because... A lot of your off-the-shelf components, like as upgrade parts, come with the standard connectors or the most used connectors. And you you have to try and buy new connectors and recrimp them. Then I've actually got a guide for that that has loads of useful information on. Uh, but it can be a bit of a pain to do.
Yeah, the fixture fit ribbon cables also not good. I'm pretty sure I mentioned that. The ones on here on the back, which I showed you earlier, that have actual locking connectors that go around to hold it in, much better solution. They are a bit thicker as well. The side wonder ones are a little bit thin. It's probably not so bad for the Z because there's a lot less motion there, but friction fit on a vibrating machine, not generally the best bet. He seemed to think that AC cable to the bed could kink and short itself over time. Yeah, pretty sure I mentioned the same thing because there's nothing uh, in the back. It's just a hole, a bit like this one is, and it even comes out the box with a massive kink in it. I've probably mentioned the same on that printer, on the um, Genius. It seems to be quite a common problem with cheap machines as they just don't bother with any cable management for the, uh, for the bed. Do you hate this printer yet? No, I don't hate it. There are parts which are not very good, but I don't hate it. Hopefully they doubled up the heater wires in the ribbon cable. Yeah, I, I think they probably would have done. That's why they've got like literally like 15 or 20 cables and they use a bunch of them for the heating. I don't know that as a fact. That would just be my guess of how they would do it. Print finished. And of course it's gone all the way to the back because why not? course now we've got glue stick on there it's not going to come off at all Ooh, well at least it's off so I should point out that this is a extra small size benchy this was at like 60% or so so the issues do tend to look a little bit worse on this size than they do on the full size version especially once I zoom in on the camera and make everything look like a massive problem Overall, not that bad, but the overhang cooling is really, really, really letting it down. Oh, let's see if I can get it. Do, 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 do. Come on, Mr. Camera, please. Apologies for not being able to hold it straight. Let's see if I can... There we go. That's a bit more stable. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that's a cooling issue. I think if that was cooling a little bit faster with 100% fan, it might improve. But the, the, the cooling fan is really not very powerful. It looks the same as the Creality one, but for some reason I think maybe the duct design is just terrible because it doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot of effective cooling. Just rotate it around a bit. Quick look at the back. The back and roof look quite a lot better they look a bit more like what I would expect from a good printer in the areas where it's good it is quite good but in the areas where it's bad it's really bad <laughs> and now it's wobbling because it's sitting on one of the buttons the chimney has turned out reasonably well which is odd because there was not much cooling. Presumably that's just a layer time thing, typically on the chimney. You can solve it with loads of cooling or just by slowing down or maybe moving the nozzle away. I think in this case it just slowed it down a lot. Stops pumping loads of hot plastic into a very small area. So. There we go. That has been and will always be the Anet ET4 Pro. A fairly reasonably priced, lowish cost, 
Looks like around $200 during the Black Friday deals. Available on Banggood, link below. Thank you very much to Anet for sending it to me to take a look at. It does have a number of issues. My primary safety concern is the bed cable. Again, the same as the Labist's ET4. The management at the bed is not good and the management at the back is also not good at all. It's nice that it's got an inductive probe, a capacitive probe rather, and the instructions for assembly were most of the way there. They really need to sort out their act on Kira because 14.7 is really not the version to be using. That needs to come right up to latest version, four point something, get a guide in for something that's recent and you'll be running away with probably significantly better print quality right out of the box. Nice that it has a filament sensor. You often don't see those on really cheap machines. For example, Ender 3 doesn't have that. So nice that it's included here. Likewise with the bed leveling. The electrical side of it actually was quite surprising in terms of the, all of the internal stuff. It had decent connectors. I don't know exactly the connector ratings. I'm going to assume they were correct, but I not checked every single connector rating. But they were locking connectors, which means they shouldn't come loose with vibration, which is very good. Also, during shipping, they won't come loose. They were reasonably well managed. Both of the mains wires, the live and the neutral, were cut with a switch. So that's also good. The power supply used is a genuine meanwhile unit, 320 watts, which should be sufficient for this sort of setup. Although it is the that 320, 24 type power supply has potentially bad electrical interference and not great on European circuits. So that's pretty much the summary for today, I think. Overall, not terrible. Definitely better than the ANA A8, so they are going in the right direction. But still, a number of things I think that could probably be improved. And maybe if you do get one, that's something you might want to take a look at. So, yes, once again, thank you very much to ANET for sending me the printout. Link in the description below. Thank you all for watching and sticking with me through this couple of hours live stream where we get everything set up and hopefully for some of you it was useful as in a kind of assembly guide or a getting started guide to help you get started set up and ready to run with your brand new anet et4 pro right i shall say goodbye now and i'll see you hopefully next week maybe next week probably next week don't have a printer yet but hopefully something will arrive this week and we'll be able to take a look at another brand new printer unboxing and assembly Goodbye for now, and I shall see you next week.